You are listening to the Speech Space Podcast, a podcast full of tips and resources for SLPs. I'm your host, Jessica Cassidy, and this is episode six. Hey everyone, I'm really excited to be here today talking about stuttering. So just a quick side note, some of you might be wondering, am I going to do all of my podcast about stuttering? No, I just happen to be on a stuttering kick lately and that's just the direction that the podcast has gone, but I plan to cover, cover other topics as well. So I know that this is an area that makes a lot of SLPs sweat and they're not sure where to start or don't feel comfortable treating stuttering but I'm here today to help you get ready for your next stuttering evaluation, so let's get started. Okay, so you get word that you'll be evaluating a new client or student that stutters. Where do you begin? So let's talk about some important background information you'll wanna get from the parents. Hopefully you'll have access to the parents. If it's a client of yours, they'll be coming in to your clinic. And if it's a parent of a child in the school, hopefully you'll be able to connect with them through email or by phone. So you're going to want to know a little bit about the pregnancy, birth, and overall development of their child. And with that information, you're looking for anything abnormal that could signal some sort of neurological issue as the cause for their stuttering. You know, oftentimes there's going to be a family history of stuttering, and sometimes there's no medical or family history at all. And that's okay too. You just want to make sure this is something that you investigate and include in your report. Another important component in regards to the history is the age that the stuttering began and how long it's persisted. You might also want to ask about triggers or if there's been anything that they can connect and increase in the frequency of stuttering with. And of course, you're going to want to ask about, especially for the younger ones, about their uh, speech and language development, if that was normal and on track as well. Okay, so now you've gathered all of your background information. So now what? Well, we need to figure out what our student or client speech sounds like and if stuttering is a cause for concern. And if so, how this impacts their life. Now, I just want to take a minute to focus on what I just said there, how it impacts their life. We need to make sure that we're evaluating all aspects of the client's experience of the stuttering. So not only are we looking at the number of disfluencies and secondary characteristics, but we also need to examine negative reactions that one might have and the adverse impact or functional limitations of their stuttering. I think this is really important to mention because it often gets missed or perhaps it's just overshadowed by the data from a standardized assessment or percentage of disfluency is taken. But whatever the case, I just want to highlight the importance of looking at the big picture because not only is this best practice, but it helps you with formulating your goals as well. Let's briefly talk about some standardized assessments that you might consider. So first up is the most obvious, the SSI. Now, if you go this route, and I know I generally would use the SSI myself because that's what I had access to, but you just need to make sure that the data is used as a piece of the puzzle and not the whole puzzle. (laughs) Uh, Another assessment tool that measures a bit more is the test of childhood stuttering, also referred to as the TOCS. It is for children age it is four to 12. And in addition to identifying and rating the severity of stuttering, it also looks at things in more depth like speech naturalness and speech rate analysis. If you're not using a standardized assessment, then you're definitely going to wanna to get a nice sample of their speech to determine the prevalence of their disfluencies and the different types of disfluencies. And before you take that, you'll want to decide if you're going to be doing your disfluency count at the syllable level or the word level, and whether you're going to be counting sounds or words stuttered or all disfluencies. You want to be clear about this in your documentation to make sure that the next treating therapist uses the same methods as you did when they do their evaluation. So if you were looking at all disfluencies and they were looking at stuttered disfluencies, then your data is going to be different. Same with the syllable count and word count. You want to let them know. You want to be very specific in your report so they know exactly how you did your evaluation so they can duplicate that at a later date. 
Now, we've talked about calculating the percentage of words or syllables stuttered. Let's talk about some other things you might look for if you're not using a standardized assessment that looks at other areas. You're going to want to look at secondary behaviors like eye blinking, facial grimacing, head movements, other body movements, things like that. You'll also want to look at breathing patterns to see if that's something that could be contributing to their disfluency. You'll want to check out their speaking rate. And if you wanted some more data on that for progress monitoring, you could even time how long it takes them to say a given number of words or syllables, and you could jot that number down so you could refer back to it later. It's also important to look at feelings and attitudes as well. So you could use something like the modified S scale, or you can make your own checklist. I also offer a checklist for children and adults in my stuttering screener that I offer on TPT and Gumroad. And I'll link to all these assessments that I'm talking about today in the show notes. So don't fret if you're driving or you're not in a position to take notes right now. I will have all those links for you. Okay, so back to attitudes and feelings. So this is really important to do so you can discuss any negative or limiting beliefs and tailor treatment goals to address them. You also want to learn about how the stuttering disorder affects your student or client. Are there any things that they're avoiding? Is their social life impacted? Are their grades suffering due to lack of participation? When a student's old enough, it's also important to let them be an active member in creating their goals. In my opinion, these things that I just mentioned are just as important as the speech sample that you took in the very beginning to determine the severity of the stuttering. One last thing that I'd like to mention is that when possible, you should try to collect data across different settings. This will give you some valuable insight and help guide your treatment plan. So you might want to take some data in your speech room and then also hop over to the classroom if you're in the school setting. If you're in private practice, maybe you have someone make a phone call, um, take data while the student's talking to their parent, maybe set them up with a peer who comes in for a session before or after them and observe and collect data on that. So then you have these different ideas of what settings or situations you might need to work on more so than others. And it can also just help you with progress monitoring. Sometimes, you know, you'll see a student get really fluent in your speech room, yet you know that they're not fluent in the classroom. And if you're only taking your data in your speech room, then it's not going to reflect when that student is having trouble in the classroom. So you really want to make sure that you get your data from a variety of settings. So I hope you guys found those tips for conducting a thorough stuttering eval to be helpful. And please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Jessica at thespeechspace.com is my email address and I check my email and respond to everyone that I receive. So I'm always happy to hear from you. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. Please be sure to check out the links and resources section from the show notes. That's it for today, but I invite you to join me next week when my friend Jennifer from Speech Therapy Fun joins me to give us some great tips for using common objects in speech therapy. This is especially helpful for SLPs on a tight budget, so you'll want to check it out. Until then, take care and have a great week.